Welcome back. I'm glad you've decided to join me today because we've got three stories and three numbers to lead them. Our first number is 130. That's how many dollars Ubisoft wants you to pay for the ultimate edition of Star Wars Outlaws. Or do they? Because when we take a look at their wider pricing model and uh, some of their design decisions, we have questions. The second number is seven, because seven is how many seasons Battlefield 2042 will uh, have had as its live service by the, uh, the death of its live service, because yes, they are stopping seasons and staff are being redeployed. It's an interesting story, because Battlefield is in a more healthy state, 2042 that is, than many of us actually reckoned, pulling in some pretty good numbers in Steam and actually retaining them. And our third number is zero, because that is how many Dead Space projects are in development right now. But man, the story to get us there, it's pretty damn interesting. Multiple journalists, multiple sources, all with different and often conflicting takes. Unraveling that one is going to be pretty damn good. And if you want to support us in our mission to do that sort of thing, and of course, get more content, um, you know, get all of our videos early, get them ad free, and also get loading screen delivered to your inbox every day during the week, then check out Games. It's the best way to support what we do. And, uh, you know, it's not just a, a platitude thing. Like, it, it really is. At the end of the day, the bits of my job that I don't enjoy are... AdSense and dealing with revenue just going up and down and up and down and up and down on a per video basis to the point where it becomes genuinely hard running a business like that. So um, yeah, your guys' uh, support there has really helped and we're, I mean, hey, we're going hard. You probably notice the cameras a little bit more, uh, you know, things are looking more crispy in our videos and uh, let's just say there is more to come on that. So thank you for the support. And with that said, let's talk about where your money will not be going, at least uh, that of it that uh, may or may not end up uh, with us. We're not going to spend, we're not going to be buying uh, Ultimate Edition Star Wars Outlaws for the whole team. I can, I can guarantee that. So Star Wars Outlaws is the game from Ubisoft Massive. It just got its full big story trailer and its release date is the 30th of August. And because of that, pre-orders have begun to go live. And look, it's uh, just a big flashy trailer, new experience in Star Wars. And honestly, as a game, it does actually look interesting to me, especially with them saying, basically, this isn't an Assassin's Creed Odyssey. This isn't a Assassin's Creed Valhalla, just level of, uh, I suppose is bloat the right word? Uh, yeah, seems like it's... Uh, slice of Star Wars. A lot of things look pretty high quality. The gameplay actually looks quite fun to me, and it is hitting a side of the Star Wars universe that I'm certainly a bit more interested in. That being said, the only caveat I'll put in that is I did have to groan and roll my eyes a bit going through that story trailer because, uh, well, just, you know, memberries did feel a little bit odd how they kind of pulled that off in the trailer. Let's just hope that it feels a bit more integrated in the game. But that's really not what people are talking about. No, what people are talking about is the $130 edition. Yeah, so 130 bucks. And when you look here, you see four editions of the game. $69.99, $109.99, $129.99, and $17.99 a month. With that $17.99 a month being kind of hilarious because it's saying you're getting the ultimate edition for $17.99, but, uh, if you do that on month one, yes, you will get the Ultimate Edition with access to the Season Pass that does not yet exist. That's the funny thing about Ultimate Editions being on, uh, on subscription services. It feels like a better deal than the one that you're getting uh, because, I mean, yeah, that DLC doesn't exist yet. So it's saying Ultimate Edition doesn't really make sense. This is obviously, though, a different play to the one that Microsoft did for Starfield, where, uh, yes, you could play Starfield on Game Pass, but uh, how about you go and buy the digital upgrade to a better edition so you can play it early in Game Pass? But of course, if you then unsub from Game Pass, you would end up owning a premium upgrade to a game that you don't actually own, which is kind of hilarious. Now, to break this down then, uh, it's, it's pretty obvious there is the standard edition for 70 bucks with a pre-order bonus cosmetic that makes you look like Han Solo. Oh my god, I remember him. Uh, yeah, it, it's that. The one that they probably are positioning all of this towards though is the Golden Edition because that comes with the pre-order bonus, three days early access because modern gaming is hell, and a season pass, which is the Witcher 3 style of having two story expansions available after launch, and that's $109.99, so it's $40 more than the base game. Now, in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, they were charging about $35 for that, which I suppose means that you could say the three days early access is kind of a $5 premium, but I mean, these are all numbers and game licenses. It's all 
made up anyway. Now, we then get to the Ultimate Edition. It has all of the things I just talked about, and two cosmetic DLC bundles, and a digital art book. Who's gonna buy that? Like, yeah, you can You can be Lando Calrissian. Uh, it also has got a fan favorite uh, scoundrel character from the comics called uh, Dr. Chelly Afra. Um, so, those are generally priced at about 10 bucks, uh, you know, each after launch because it's Ubisoft, where we do have microtransactions for our premium priced single player games. Love that, don't I? But it feels weird. It feels weird. It's really expensive, and a lot of people just fail to see the value in that. You're paying pretty much double the price of the base game, and you get a season pass and a bunch of cosmetics. It does feel weird. I mean, especially when so many of us remember buying physical collector's editions for games that didn't cost 130 bucks. They sometimes even cost less than that. This is bizarre, but to make sense of it, just look at the design, right? The gold edition is meant to be enticing with the season pass and the early access, um, this sort of thing where people will look at that and think, ah, oh, sure, if it's a good game, I'll probably just uh, get the season pass content anyway, so I guess it's a good deal, but that's a hefty premium for a season pass. And also, I think it's actually them getting away with selling a season pass not at a discount, because it used to be that uh, you could buy the season pass or you could buy the individual DLC but the season pass, you know, you'd be... Your downside is you don't know if the DLC is good. The upside is you'll get all of it at a far lower cost. In this case, it does not look like a far lower cost, but it does look like what they're essentially getting you to do is because of the early access perk, buying that uh, season pass effectively at like 35, 40 bucks, which does feel full price and uh, not a discount uh, to me. So I suppose that's some smart manipulation of value to ultimately mean that you pay as much money up front as is possible rather than say, getting the game on launch and then maybe picking up the DLC when it's on a sale or something like that. Then, of course, next, the Ultimate Edition is available with uh, Ubisoft Plus Premium for only $17.99 a month. So you could get that and have access to the whole Ultimate Edition of the game for a month. It's probably enough time to complete the game. In fact, they have said that it's not a turbo bloat Ubisoft game. Uh, thing is, though, that's you getting access to an Ultimate Edition. But, well, the main thing that makes it Ultimate, which is that you know, DLC being included, that's not there. So really what you're getting is the standard game, early access, and access to two DLC, uh, like, cosmetic bundles. Ubisoft have probably ran the numbers here and found that it's fine, you know? Um, yes, you can go and play the game for $17.99, finish it in a month, and never touch it again. For some reason, though, even if you can do that, it still is worth Ubisoft at least in their own thinking, to grow their subscription. Make of that what you will, I suppose. I think ultimately the $130 price point is mainly serving to make the Ubisoft premium subscription actually like make sense to people or feel like it is a better value. Ultimately, though, no matter what you do, Ubisoft wins because you've bought their game. So grats to them. But you know who's not winning? A small section of the Battlefield audience. So let's move on to our next story. Right. Battlefield 2042, obviously total shit show launch, big disaster, but they did seven seasons. They were legally obliged to do three, but they did seven. People thought they'd maybe do one or two, but no, this game genuinely had more support than I think just about anybody expected, at least in its early days. Now, they're still going to be adding new in-game challenges, events, and uh, modes, and doing ongoing maintenance, but major content drops like maps, new guns, and that sort of thing via seasons, that's not happening. And this is disappointing, number one, to the people who've played 2042, but also to anyone just looking broadly at the Battlefield franchise, because you'll notice that as soon as they shifted to the live service, model, just every game became a far worse value proposition. Do you remember how many maps Battlefield 1 got? Compare that to Battlefield 5, compare that to 2042, and tell me that the live service era is, uh, is good for us. Yeah, bullshit. Now, with 2042, when you look at the player numbers, you see that they did a really good job of getting people back in there. It was not fast enough for loads of people, but... They actually did put the work in, even when many of their own fans were saying, it's not worth it, just move on to the next thing. So for the people who just wanted 2042 to die so that the next Battlefield could be better, I suppose you're getting your wish. There's no more main 2042 dev. But when you take a look at the player numbers, you do see that there's plenty of people who will miss out on this. So back by April 2022, when you look at the Steam chart, you basically see it's hitting the bottom of the Y-axis. Move that on, though, and you see the free weekends that had them over 100k. And then, you know, recently they hit uh, just shy of 40k. And they are consistently holding numbers that are in the low to, to mid, sometimes even higher 20,000s. That's just in Steam, of course. This game is also on the EA app. It's also on consoles as well. 
So that's plenty of people who will just be playing this version of the game on an ongoing basis without getting a lot more content. So we'll have to see if that, of course, just leads to decreasing player numbers. What I can say, though, is that 2042 is in a way better state than it's ever been in. And if you do own it, well, you may as well give it a shot. You you did buy it in the past. And even if you were disappointed by it, they have genuinely made it uh, way better. Not enough for some, not enough for many, but they did actually commit developers to making that game not a mess, which I suppose is a commendable thing when they could have just cut and ran. Like, all I had to do was technically ship four seasons, do what they said they would do when selling their uh, season pass equivalent, and then just uh, run away with the money. But they seemingly decided to keep on spending money to, uh, to, to keep that game alive. I mean, look, it's not grasping victory from the jaws of defeat, but, you know, it's less shit than it could have been. As for the future then, well, they have spun up a team within EA Motive to work on more Battlefield. That's because they've got experience working in the Frostbite engine, and of course they also made Battlefront 2 single-player campaign. So they're going to be doing that. Meanwhile, their single-player efforts are going to be focused on the Iron Man game, which they have claimed has just hit a major milestone. That's going on, of course, there will be some staff that have been moved over from the now-closed Ridgeline Studios, and that basically means there's a lot of people who are working on Battlefield across the world at multiple different studios. For the player's perspective, though, you're going to be waiting until, I think, earliest 2025, right? Until there's a new Battlefield. For the current Battlefields, though, 2042 is still really good time. You can go and play it. It's actually pretty great. I mean, I've, you know, tune into the odd Jack Frags or um, Level Cap Gaming video to sort of see what the shooter crowd are up to, and it does seem it's in a really good state. Also, they've added in kernel-level anti-cheat to Battlefield 5. Now, there is the whole kernel-level anti-cheat. Is, uh, is this good? Is this bad? I get that debate. Let's not have it again, because we've already talked about it loads. I'll at least say that from a player's perspective, a lot of botting can ruin your experience. It can just ruin your experience and if you only have 10 hours of gaming budget a week and if three or four of those hours get ruined by cheaters that's a significant portion of your gaming time being tarnished and because time is extremely valuable to people that means that a lot will just go and choose another franchise that doesn't have a rampant cheating problem so that is a good thing uh, battlefield 5 is actually a really good game it was a terrible live service product and it had a stupid marketing campaign. But I do think a lot of like the core of its, uh, its gunplay is great. I think its movement tech was really, really good. Destructibility, uh, pretty good. I liked how you could, you know, build up your fortifications and stuff. I thought it was a really good game that was just completely shot in the back by, uh, you know, by its marketing campaign, by things that people at EA said. And I suppose the part of me that uh, is passionate about history has severe questions for, um, you know, writing people out of history who did actual things and actually died to do actual things. And I think if you're going in and around their story, you should probably do their story instead of, um, you know, just kind of plowing over it. Definitely mm, at that one. But anyway, what will the future mean? Well, there'll be a new Battlefield game. We're all expecting it to be some sort of Battlefield platform. Obviously, Battlefield Portal was a thing in 2042 that actually was pretty awesome. So we're expecting that. And I think we all know that if they cock it up again, that will be Battlefield well and truly dead. There are, however, things counting in its favor. Number one, it does have a low bar to pass. Remember, 2042 was kind of thrown together in like 12, 16, 18 months. It was thrown together pretty quick anyway by a team with humongous turnover rates in the wake of its original vision as a 128 player uh, battle royale. So 2042 was always screwed. Doesn't seem like they're going to be repeating that. And of course, Battlefield is being headed up by Vince Zampella. You got to say, Vince Zampella has got a hell of a track record from... I mean, what, from Medal of Honor, then through to Call of Duty, then through to everything with Respawn. I mean, Respawn kind of saving EA's ass. <sighs> I'm jaded. I'm cynical. I'm not pre-ordering. But if there's a new vision, if he's leading this, maybe some of the things that have led to past Zampella-related projects, um, maybe some of those positive factors would be playing here. Maybe there's some hope. Tell you what, there's not much hope for. Dead Space 2 remake. Let's talk about what happened to Dead Space and the crazy story of the uh, reporting here. So this is one that is both sad and interesting to pick through. And it starts with Jeff Grubb of Giant Bomb. This was captured by VGC, went all over the internet. Here's the quote from Jeff. They were working on Dead Space 2 and they are no longer working on it. It is on the shelf because the first game had lackluster sales. 
is how it was phrased to me. So that's what Jeff said. Jeff went on to say, so if you were looking forward to Dead Space 2, it's straight up bad news. Does this mean it never happens? I don't know if that's the case, but as it stands right now, they were working on it. It was in the concepting phase, I believe. It was in pre-production. And now that work has been put on the shelf and uh, they're done with it, the studio is making Iron Man and Battlefield. So immediately the headline story here is so obvious it is. EA, once again, have killed a beloved thing that we really wanted to be good, and also it's a single-player game, and, uh, hmm, don't you remember the history of the Dead Space franchise? You know, Dead Space 3. It's a tale as old as time, one that we love to tell. Of course, ultimately, nothing had been announced here. They, um, had said to the public that they make two projects at a time. Uh, whenever we found out that Motive would be assisting in Battlefield, somebody called Hawkeye said to them, does this mean we won't see Dead Space again? To which Motive just said, we'll continue to operate as a two-project team and we're focused on Iron Man and Battlefield. Then things get spicy because Jeff Grubb is not the only person with sources. Number one, EA themselves broke cover and gave a very specifically worded statement to IGN saying we don't normally comment on rumors, but there's no validity to this story. Now, as Jeff Grubb himself says, um, you don't and probably shouldn't believe what a company says about things in a situation like this, especially when they're not referring to specifics in their denial. The thing is that IGN's Cat Bailey also has sources. She said a source tells IGN that the Dead Space remake was ultimately considered to have done well, though other reports suggest it missed expectations. And she later said on Twitter, my own sources tell me a Dead Space 2 remake was never considered. I don't currently see a strong internal appetite to remake Dead Space 2. So what we got here is two sources that appear to contradict each other. How can a game be worked on and then also never be considered? Well, to add more confusion, we've got Jason Schreier coming in with a third source or collection of sources, shall we say a third understanding based on sources, alleging that EA actually did make the decision to kill it in spring of 2023 after the release of, uh, you know, of the Dead Space 1 remake, that Dead Space 1 missed sales expectations, and that staff had been working for months on plans for a new entry in the franchise, which may not have been a remake of the original Dead Space 2, but that since last summer, a core team were working on other pitches while development staff were reassigned. So we basically have got three versions of this story, which broadly line up with the idea of something being maybe considered at a point, but then killed, but very much disagreeing on the framing of the story. Of course, this is a really good lesson for all of us in how sourcing works and how reporting works. Ultimately, a source will be able to communicate through their, the lens of their own bias what they believe to be true based on whenever they got their information, which of course could always be out of date. Uh, but the main outstanding point here is the one talking about EA's greed and overblown expectations. Because you see, there's a claim going around that the Dead Space remake sold 2 million copies. We could not find a reputable source verifying that as fact. What is going around though, is EA's justification for making Dead Space 3 a sort of microtransaction full co-op game. Because EA said that at uh, Dead Space 3, they would expect to get 2 million sales. It was a single player game and that's why they did co-op. So if they truly did get 2 million sales for Dead Space uh, Remake, while not necessarily meaningful, uh, that, that, that would just honestly be kind of hilarious. But do remember, even if they did get 2 million sales, that shit ain't going to translate to revenue, especially here, because they, uh, they ended up doing some pretty deep discounting. I'll tell you why. Look, it was a really good game, but they did start discounting it pretty aggressively. This is a game that is regularly on sale for like 20, 25 bucks, down from a $70 launch cost. I don't think 70 is the right price for this. No way. 20? is a goddamn steal because this is a really good remake. Like it looks gorgeous. Um, I've recently been uh, playing it myself. I also did not pay $70 for it. Do you know why I didn't pay $70 for it? Cause I didn't think it was worth $70. And that brings me to one of the things we've been talking about as a bit of a theme in this channel. Flexible pricing is good. We have seen multiple games recently go for $40. Um, even some games like Assassin's Creed Mirage having a cheaper price point and that actually doing well. So I think this was literally just too expensive. And remember, your most important time is your launch. So yes, if you launch at 70, you do have lots of discount headroom and those discounts will look like a good deal. But that only lasts so long. What if this came out at an ideal price, let's say $49.99, what would its sales have been like? Because I can tell you, as somebody who really loves Dead Space, 
At 40 bucks, I would have picked that up on day one instead of picking it up on a far deeper discount. And maybe if they had more day one sales, that ball would have been rolling stronger. And then maybe when they discounted it from $40 to $25, the same price they're selling it for right now, people would have just continued piling on and they would have had better sales. I don't know. To me, when I look at this, I just think that this may have been a mismatch in pricing. Uh, because look, while Dead Space is great, you're not going to be able to pull off Resi 4 remake numbers because, I mean, I love Dead Space, but it's not the cultural icon that Resi 4 is. And frankly, while it is a fantastic game, I don't think it's as good a game as Resi 4. But uh, honestly, at that point, look, you could split the difference. They're both fantastic games. The point is, look, buy this for 20 bucks. Um, but to go back to the story then, there's likely two simultaneous answers. Answer number one, Dead Space is a franchise that a lot of people love and will loudly talk about wanting back, but that does not necessarily translate to massive sales. We can say maybe that's because they're not willing to back up what they think with money and they're duplicitous bastards. <laughs> or we could say it was mispriced at launch. And that meant that it never really got critical mass. And our second answer is EA probably gave motive the funding to make a big, modern, full-scale remake of Dead Space and just didn't see meaningful profit. So why would they do something else when they could work on Iron Man? And remember, Spider-Man 2 was a really expensive game, but uh, was it like 100 million or something like that of the bill was footed by Marvel, by Disney. So they can make an Iron Man game with a lot of the risk taken away by, uh, by their development partner, and they can make, uh, you know, an internal title with, uh, you know, with Battlefield. That's a part of the broader strategy that the company wants to go on. I think it's just that. They considered it. It didn't make sense. Likely, I would posit because of a mismatch in pricing. And that means that because of opportunity cost, they didn't do it. Dead Space is still dead, except it isn't, because you can pick up the Dead Space 1 remake for like 25 bucks, and it's an amazing value at that price, and then for even less money, you can just play Dead Space 2. You don't need the remake. The remake's only really relevant if you like want it to be running at a high frame rate on a console. You know, I'm assuming the normal Dead Space 2 doesn't support high frame rate in consoles. Just download Dead Space 2 and Steam, it's awesome. It doesn't need a remake. It's, it's a good game. It's, it's a pretty modern game too. I don't know, man. <laughs> Remakes are weird. Anyway, that's it for today's story. Let me know what you think about all of these. And also let me know, do you think that this was a fundamental appetite issue? Or do you think this is that people were not willing to spend so much money on a remake? I think it's the latter. I think this was mispriced. Would I spend $70 on a new Dead Space? I would. On a remake? No. But then it's like, what would I spend that in the Resi 4 remake? Uh, yes. But I think that's saying more about Resi 4 than anything else and how much I have come to love that game. Anyway, that's it from me. Have a brilliant day. See you next time.